prepare for a spine-tingling, nerve-shattering podcast featuring all your favorite monsters. You won't believe your ears when you listen to Monster Kid Radio. Hear your host, Derek M. Cook, and his ever-rotating stable of guests discuss your favorite classic and sometimes not-so-classic monster movies. Subscribe to Monster Kid Radio through iTunes or Stitcher, or visit monsterkidradio.net before the next weekly episode of Monster Kid Radio. Go through the archives for interviews with Sarah Karloff, Victoria Price, and Joel Hodgson. Listen to the discussions about movies like Creature from the Black Lagoon, Island of Terror, and King Kong. And don't forget convention coverage from Monster Bash and the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, Classic Monsters, Modern Talk, and the head of Rondo Hatton, only on Monster Kid Radio. Welcome, listeners, to Black Clock Audio Tales. It's October, and let's get spookier than last month. So yeah, we're going to be doing ghost stories, starting with Lucky's Grove, then Nightwire, Man Size in Marble, A Neighbor's Landmark, Morella, Rats, The Death of Halpin Frazier, The Resurrectionist, and the residence at Whitmeister. So that's uh, the the stories we're going to have coming up for the next couple of days there. And then after that, we're going to have another intro here. And we're going to have a bunch of other collection of ghost stories and spooky stories, mostly ghost stories. And maybe we'll have some uh, people talking about ghost stories for the show. Thank you again so much, and if you want to know how to help the show, go to pgttcm.com and click on Info. There's also a Shop button, and you can see where the audiobooks are and where the bits and b- pieces for our monthly Cthulhu Mythos show is. If you want to help the show grow, want more Cthulhu Mythos episodes, let us know. Let us know what's going on. If you're having problems with the RSS feed, let us know. Let us know what's going on, and thank you so much, everyone. All right, let's have some spooky stories read to you by Morgan Scorpion. This episode's brought to you by BunnySlippers.com and FoundItemClothing.com. Check them out. Dino Sound Slippers, cool cult film shirts that you can wear. Keep your feet warm. Keep your torso looking cool. Winter's coming. Embrace slippers. Something like that. Let's go. Those who spend the greater part of their time in reading or writing books are, of course, apt to take rather particular notice of accumulations of books when they come across them. They will not pass a stall, a shop, or even a bedroom shelf without reading some title. And if they find themselves in an unfamiliar library, no host need trouble himself further about their entertainment. The putting of dispersed sets of volumes together or the turning right way up of those which the dusting housemaid has left in an apoplectic condition appeals to them as one of the lesser works of mercy. Happy in these employments, and in occasionally opening an eighteenth-century octavo to see what it is all about, and to conclude after five minutes that it deserves the seclusion it now enjoys. I had reached the middle of a wet August afternoon at Betton Court. "'You begin in a deeply Victorian manner, I said. "'Is this to continue?' "'Remember, if you please,' said my friend, "'looking at me over his spectacles, "'that I am a Victorian by birth and education, "'and that the Victorian tree "'may not unreasonably be expected to bear Victorian fruit. "'Further, remember that an immense quantity "'of clever and thoughtful rubbish "'is now being written about the Victorian age.' Now, he went on, laying his papers on his knee, that article, The Stricken Years, in the Times Literary Supplement the other day. Abel, of course it is Abel, but, oh my soul and body, do just hand it over here, will you? It's on the table by you. I thought you were to read me something you had written, I said, without moving. But of course. Yes, I know, he said. "'Very well, then, I'll do that first. 
but I should like to show you afterwards what I mean. However, and he lifted the sheets of paper and adjusted his spectacles. At Betton Court, where, generations back, two country house libraries had been fused together, and no descendant of either stock had ever faced the task of picking them over or getting rid of duplicates. Now I am not setting out to tell of rarities I may have discovered, of Shakespeare quarters bound up in volumes of political tracts, or anything of that kind, but of an experience which befell me in the course of my search, an experience which I cannot either explain away or fit into the scheme of my ordinary life. It was, I said, a wet August afternoon, rather windy, rather warm. Outside the window great trees were stirring and weeping, between them were stretches of green and yellow country, for the court stands high on a hillside, and blue hills far off, veiled with rain. Up above was a very restless and hopeless movement of low clouds travelling northwest. I had suspended my work, if you call it work, for some minutes to stand at the window and look at these things, and at the greenhouse roof on the right with the water sliding off it, and the church tower that rose behind that. I was all in favour of my going steadily on, no likelihood of clearing up for hours to come. I therefore returned to the shelves, lifted out a set of eight or nine volumes, lettered tracts, and conveyed them to the table for closer examination. They were for the most part of the reign of Anne. There was a good deal of the late peace, the late war, the conduct of the Allies. There were also letters to a convocation man, sermons preached at St. Michael's, Queen Hythe, inquiries to a late charge of the Right Reverend of the Lord Bishop of Winchester, or more probably Winton, to his clergy, things all very lively one, and indeed still keeping so much of their old sting, that I was tempted to betake myself into an armchair in the window, and give them more time than I had intended. Besides, I was somewhat tired by the day. The church clock struck four, and it really was four, for in 1889 there was no saving of daylight. So I settled myself, and first I glanced over some of the war pamphlets, and pleased myself by trying to pick out Swift by his style from among the undistinguished. But the war pamphlets needed more knowledge of the geography of the low countries than I had. I turned to the church, and read several pages of what the Dean of Canterbury said to the Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge on the occasion of their anniversary meeting in 1711. When I turned over a letter from a beneficed clergyman in the country to the Bishop of C, I was becoming languid, and I gazed for some moments at the following sentence without surprise. This abuse, for I think myself justified in calling it by that name, is one which I am persuaded your Lordship would if twere known to you, exert your utmost efforts to do away. But I am also persuaded that you no more know of its existence than, in the words of the country song, that which walks in Betton Wood knows why it walks or why it cries. Then, indeed, I did sit up in my chair and run my fingers along the lines to make sure that I had read them right. There was no mistake. Nothing more was to be gathered from the rest of the pamphlet. The next paragraph definitely changed the subject. But I have said enough upon this topic, were its opening words. So discreet, too, was the namelessness of the beneficed clergyman that he refrained even from initials, and had his letter printed in London. The riddle was of a kind that might faintly interest anyone. To me, who have dabbled a good deal in works of folklore, it was really exciting. I was set upon solving it, on finding out, I mean, what story lay behind it, and at least I felt myself lucky in one point, that whereas I might have come on the paragraph in some college library far away, here I was at Betton, on the very scene of action. The church clock struck five, and a single stroke on a gong followed. This, I knew, meant tea. I heaved myself out of the deep chair and obeyed the summons. My host and I were alone at the court. He came in soon, wet from a round of landlord's errands, 
and with pieces of local news which had to be passed on before I could make an opportunity of asking whether there was a particular place in the parish that was still known as Betton Wood. Betton Wood, he said, was a short mile away, just on the crest of Betton Hill, and my father stubbed up the last bit of it when it paid better to grow corn than scrub oaks. Why do you want to know about Betton Wood? Because, I said, in an old pamphlet I was reading just now, there are two lines of a country song which mention it, and they sound as if there was a story belonging to them. Someone says that someone else knows no more of whatever it may be, than that which walks in Betton Wood knows why it walks or why it cries. Goodness, said Philipson. I wonder whether that was why. I must ask old Mitchell. He muttered something else to himself, and took some more tea, thoughtfully. Whether that was why, I said. Yes, I was going to say whether that was why my father had the wood stubbed up. I said just now it was to get more plough land, but I don't really know if it was. I don't believe he ever broke it up. It's rough pasture at this moment. But there's one old chap at least who'd remember something of it. Old Mitchell. He looked at his watch. Blessed if I don't go down there and ask him. I don't think I'll tell you, he went on. He's not so likely to tell anything he thinks is odd if there's a stranger by. Well, mind you remember every single thing he does tell. As for me, if it clears up, I shall go out. And if it doesn't, I shall go on with the books. It did clear up, sufficiently at least to make me think it worth while to walk up the nearest hill and look over the country. I did not know the lie of the land. It was the first visit I had paid to Philipson, and this was the first day of it. So I went down the garden and through the wet shrubberies with a very open mind, and offered no resistance to the indistinct impulse. Was it, however, so very indistinct? which kept urging me to bear to the left whenever there was a forking of the path. The result was that after ten minutes or more of dark going between dripping rows of box and laurel and privet, I was confronted by a stone arch in the Gothic style set in the stone wall which encircled the whole domain. The door was fastened by a spring lock, and I took the precaution of leaving this on the jar as I passed out into the road. That road I crossed, and entered a narrow lane between hedges which led upward, and that lane I pursued, at a leisurely pace, for as much as half a mile, and went on to the field to which it led. I was now on a good point of vantage for taking in the situation of the court, the village, and the environment, and I leant upon a gate, and gazed westward and downward. I think we must all know the landscapes. Are they by Burkett's Foster, or somewhat earlier, which in the form of woodcuts, decorate the volumes of poetry that lay on the drawing-room table of our fathers and grandfathers, volumes in art-cloth embossed bindings, that strikes me as being the right phrase, I confess myself an admirer of them, and especially of those which show the peasant leaning over a gate in a hedge, and surveying, at the bottom of a downward slope, the village church spire, embosomed amid venerable trees, and a fertile plain intersected by hedgerows and bounded by distant hills, behind which the orb of day is sinking, or it may be rising, amid level clouds illumined by his dying, or nascent, ray. The expressions employed here are those which seem appropriate to the pictures I have in mind, and were there an opportunity, I would try to work in the vale, the grove, the cot, and the flood. Anyhow, they are beautiful to me, these landscapes and it was just such a one that I was now surveying. It might have come straight out of gems of sacred song, selected by a lady, and given as a birthday present to Eleanor Philipson in 1852 by her attached friend Millicent Graves. All at once I turned as if I had been stung. There thrilled into my right ear and pierced my head a note of incredible sharpness, like the shriek of a bat, only ten times intensified, the kind of thing that makes one wonder if something has not given way in one's brain. I held my breath and covered my ear and shivered. Something in the circulation. Another minute or two, I thought, and I return home. But I must fix the view a little more firmly in my mind. Only when I turned to it again, the taste was gone out of it. 
The sun was down behind the hill, and the light was off the fields, and when the clock bell in the church tower struck seven, I thought no longer of kind mellow evening hours of rest, and scents of flowers and woods on evening air, and of how someone on a farm a mile or two off would be saying, how clear Betton Bell sounds to-night after the rain. But instead images came to me of dusty beams and creeping spiders, and savage owls up in the tower, and forgotten graves and their ugly contents below, and a flying time, and all it had taken out of my life. And just then into my left ear, close as if lips had been put within an inch of my head, the frightful scream came thrilling again. There was no mistake possible now. It was from outside. With no language but a cry was the thought that flashed into my mind. Hideous it was beyond anything I had heard of or have heard since, but I could read no emotion in it, and doubted if I could read any intelligence. All its effect was to take away every vestige, every possibility of enjoyment, and make this no place to stay in one moment more. Of course there was nothing to be seen, but I was convinced that, if I waited, the thing would pass me again on its aimless, endless beat, and I could not bear the notion of a third repetition. I hurried back to the lane and down the hill, but when I came to the arch in the wall I stopped. Could I be sure of my way among those dank alleys, which would be danker and darker now? No, I confessed to myself that I was afraid. So jarred were all my nerves with the cry on the hill, that I really felt I could not afford to be startled even by a little bird in a bush, or a rabbit. I followed the road which followed the wall, and I was not sorry when I came to the gate and the lodge, and descried Philipson coming up towards it from the direction of the village. "'And where have you been?' said he. "'I took the lane that goes up the hill opposite the stone arch in the wall.' "'Oh, did you? Then you've been very near where Betton Wood used to be.' "'at least if you followed it up to the top and out into the field. "'And if the reader will believe it, "'that was the first time that I put two and two together. "'Did I at once tell Philipson what had happened to me? "'I did not. "'I have not had other experiences of the kind "'which are called supernatural or normal or physical, "'but though I knew very well I must speak of this one before long, "'I was not at all anxious to do so.' and I think I have read that this is a common case. So all I said was, Did you see the old man you meant to? Old Mitchell, yes, I did, and got something of a story out of him. I'll keep it till after dinner. It really is rather odd. So when we were settled after dinner, he began to report, faithfully, as he said, the dialogue that had taken place. Mitchell, not far off eighty years old, was in his elbow chair. The married daughter with whom he lived was in and out preparing for tea. After the usual salutations, Mitchell, I want you to tell me something about the wood. What wood's that, Master Reginald? Betton Wood. Do you remember it? Mitchell slowly raised his hand and pointed an accusing forefinger. It were your father done away with Betton Wood, Master Reginald, I can tell you that much. "'Well, I know it was, Mitchell. "'You needn't look at me as if it were my fault.' "'Your fault? "'No, I says it were your father done it, before your time.' "'Yes, and I dare say, if the truth was known, "'it was your father that advised him to do it, "'and I want to know why.' "'Mitchell seemed a little amused. "'Well,' he said, "'my father were woodman to your father and your grandfather before him, "'and if he didn't know what belonged to his business, he ought to done.' "'And if he did give advice that way, I suppose he might have had his reasons, mightn't he now?' "'Of course he might, and I want you to tell me what they were.' "'Well now, Master Reginald, whoever makes you think I know what his reasons might have been, I don't know how many years ago. "'Well, to be sure, it is a long time and you might easily have forgotten, if ever you knew. "'I suppose the only thing is for me to go and ask old Ellis what he can recollect about it.' That had the effect I hoped for. Old Ellis, he growled. First time ever I heard anyone say old Ellis were any use for any purpose. I should have thought you'd know better than you yourself, Master Reginald. What do you suppose old Ellis can tell you better than what I can about Betton Wood? And what call have he got to be put afore me, I should like to know? 
His father weren't woodman on the place. He were ploughman. That's what he was. And so anyone can tell you what knows. Anyone could tell you, I says. Just so, Mitchell. But if you know all about Bettenwood and won't tell me why, I must do the next best I can and try and get it out of somebody else. And old Ellis has been on the place very nearly as long as you have. That he ain't. Not by eighteen months. Who says I wouldn't tell you nothing about the wood? I ain't no objection. Only it's a funny kind of tale, and tain't right to my thinking it, it should be all about the parish. You, Lizzie, do you keep in your kitchen a bit? Me and Master Reginald wants to have a word or two in private. But one thing I'd like to know, Master Reginald, what come to put you upon asking about it today? Oh, well, I happened to hear of an old saying about something that walks in bed and wood, and I wondered if that had anything to do with it being cleared away, that's all. Well, you was in the right, Master Reginald, however you come to hear of it, and I believe I can tell you the rights of it better than anyone in this parish, let alone old Ellis. You see, it came about this way, that the shortest road to Allen's farm laid through the wood, and when we was little, my poor mother, she used to go so many times in the week to the farm to fetch a quart of milk, because Mr. Allen, what had the farm then under your father, he was a good man, and any one that had a young family to bring up, he was willing to allow em so much in the week. But never you mind about that now, and my poor mother she never liked to go through the wood, because there was a lot of talk in the place, and sayings like what you spoke about just now. But every now and again, when she happened to be late with her work, she'd have to take the short road through the wood, and as sure as ever she did, she'd come home in a rare state. I remember her and my father talking about it, and he'd say, well, but it can't do you no harm, Emma. And she'd said, Oh, but you haven't an idea of it, George. Why, it went right through my head, she says. And I came over all bewildered-like, and as if I didn't know where I was. You see, George, she says, she says, it ain't as if you were about there in the dusk. You always goes there in the daytime now, don't you? And he says, Why, to be sure I do. Do you take me for a fool? And so they'd go on. And time passed by, and I think it wore her out, because, you understand, it weren't no use to go for the milk not till the afternoon, and she wouldn't never send none of us children instead, for fear we should get a fright. Nor wouldn't she tell us about it herself. No, she says, it's bad enough for me. I don't want no one else to go through it, nor yet hear talk about it. But one time I recollect, she says, Well, first, it's a rustling like all along in the bushes coming very quick, either towards me or after me according to the time. And then there comes this scream as appears to pierce right through from the one ear to the other, and the later I am coming through the more like I am to hear it twice over. But thanks be I never yet heard it the three times. And then I asked her, and I says, Why, that seems like someone walking to and fro all the time, don't it? And she says, Yes, it do. And whatever it is she wants, I can't think. And I says, is it a woman, mother? And she says, yes, I've heard it is a woman. Anyway, the end of it was my father, he spoke to your father and told him the wood was a bad wood. There's never a bit of game in it and there's never a bird's nest there, he says, and it ain't no manner of use to you. And after a lot of talk, your father, he come and see my mother about it. And he sees she weren't one of those silly women as gets nervous about nothing at all. And he made up his mind that there was something in it. And after that, he asked about in the neighbourhood. And I believe he made out something and wrote it down in a paper what very like you've got up at the court, Master Reginald. And then he gave the order and the wood was stubbed up. They'd done all the work in the daytime, I recollect, and was never there after three o'clock. Didn't they find anything to explain it, Mitchell? No bones or anything of that kind? Nothing at all, Master Reginald. Only the mark of a hedge and ditch along the middle, much about where the quickset hedge run now. And with all the work they done, if there hadn't been anyone put away there, they was bound to find em. But I don't know whether it done much good after all. People here don't seem to like the place no better than they did afore. That's what I got out of Mitchell, said Philipson. And as far as any explanation goes, it leaves us very much where we were. I must see if I can't find that paper. Why didn't your father ever tell you about the business? I said. He died before I went to school, you know, and I imagine he didn't want to frighten us children by any such story. I can remember being shaken and slapped by my nurse for running up that lane towards the wood when we were coming back rather late one winter afternoon. But in the daytime, 
No one interfered with our going into the wood if we wanted to. Only we never did want. Hmm, I said, and then. Do you think you'll be able to find that paper that your father wrote? Yes, he said, I do. I expect it's no farther away than that cupboard behind you. There's a bundle or two of things especially put aside, most of which I've looked through at various times, and I know there's one envelope labelled Betton Wood, but as there was no Betton Wood any more, I never thought it would be worth while to open it, and I never have. We'll do it now, though. Before you do, I said, I was still reluctant, but I thought this was perhaps the moment for my disclosure. I'd better tell you I think Mitchell was right when he doubted if clearing away the wood had put things straight. And I gave the account you have heard already. I need not say Philipson was interested. Still there, he said. It's amazing. Look here, will you come out there with me now and see what happens? I will do no such thing, I said. And if you knew the feeling, you'd be glad to walk ten miles in the opposite direction. Don't talk of it. Open your envelope, and let's hear what your father made out. He did so, and read me the three or four pages of jottings which it contained. At the top was written a motto from Scott's Glen Finless, which seemed to me well chosen. Where walks, they say, the shrieking ghost. Then there were notes of his talk with Mitchell's mother, from which I extract only this much. I asked her if she never thought she saw anything to account for the sounds she heard. She told me no more than once on the darkest evening she ever came through the wood. And then she seemed forced to look behind her as the rustling came in the bushes. And she thought she saw something all in tatters with the two arms held out in front of it coming on very fast. And at that she ran from the stile, and tore her gown all to flinders getting over it. Then he had gone to two other people whom he found very shy of talking. They seemed to think, among other things, that it reflected discredit on the parish. However, one, Mrs. Emma Frost, was prevailed upon to repeat what her mother had told her. They say it was a lady of title that married twice over. And her first husband went by the name of Brown. Or it might have been Brian. Yes, there were Brians at the court before it came into our family, Philipson put in. And she removed her neighbour's landmark. Leastways, she took in a fair piece of the best pasture in Betton Parish, what belonged by rights to two children, as hadn't no one to speak for them. And they say, years after, she went from bad to worse, and made out false papers to gain thousands of pounds up in London. And at least they was proved in law to be false, and she would have been tried and put to death, very like, only she escaped away for the time. But no one can't avoid the curse that's laid on them that removes the landmark, and so we take it she can't leave Betton before someone take and put it right again. At the end of the paper there was a note to this effect. I regret that I cannot find any clue to previous owners of the fields adjoining the wood. I do not hesitate to say that if I could discover their representatives, I should do my best to indemnify them for the wrong done to them in years now long past, for it is undeniable that the wood is very curiously disturbed in the manner described by the people of the place. In my present ignorance alike of the extent of the land wrongly appropriated and of the rightful owners, I am reduced to keeping a separate note of the profits derived from this part of the estate and my custom has been to apply the sum that would represent the annual yield of about five acres to the common benefit of the parish and to charitable uses, and I hope that those who succeed me may see fit to continue this practice. So much for the elder Mr. Philipson's paper. To those who, like myself, are readers of the state trials, it will have gone far to illuminate the situation. They will remember how between the years 1678 and 1684 the Lady Ivy, formerly Theodosia Bryan, was alternately plaintiff and defendant in a series of trials in which she was trying to establish a claim against the Dean and Chapter of St. Paul's for a considerable and very valuable tract of land in Shadwell. How in the last of those trials, presided over by Lord Chief Justice Jeffreys, it was proved up to the hilt that the deeds upon which she based her claim were forgeries executed under her orders, and how, after an information for perjury and forgery was issued against her, she disappeared completely. 
so completely, indeed, that no expert has ever been able to tell me what became of her. Does not the story I have told suggest that she may still be heard of on the scene of one of her earlier and more successful exploits? The Night Wire by H. F. Arnold Read by Morgan Scorpion There is something ungodly about these night wire jobs. You sit up here on the top floor of a skyscraper and listen in to the whispers of a civilization. New York, London, Calcutta, Bombay, Singapore. They're your next door neighbors after the street lights go dim and the world has gone to sleep. Alone in the quiet hours between two and four, the receiving operators doze over their sounders and the news comes in. Fires and disasters and suicides, murders, crowds, catastrophes. Sometimes an earthquake with a casualty list as long as your arm. The night wire man takes it down almost in his sleep, picking it off on his typewriter with one finger. Once in a long time you prick up your ears and listen. You've heard of someone you knew in Singapore, Halifax or Paris long ago. Maybe they've been promoted, but more probably they've been murdered or drowned. Perhaps they just decided to quit and took some bizarre way out, made it interesting enough to get in the news. But that doesn't happen often. Most of the time you sit and doze and tap, tap on your typewriter and wish you were home in bed. Sometimes, though, queer things happen. One did the other night, and I haven't gotten over it yet. I wish I could. You see, I handled the night manager's desk in a western seaport town. What the name is doesn't matter. There is, or rather was, only one night operator on my staff, a fellow named John Morgan, about forty years of age, I should say, and a sober, hard-working sort. He was one of the best operators I ever knew, what is known as a double man. That means he could handle two instruments at once and type the stories on different typewriters at the same time. He was one of the three men I ever knew who could do it consistently, hour after hour, and never make a mistake. Generally, we used only one wire at night, but sometimes when it was late and the news was coming fast, the Chicago and Denver stations would open a second wire and then Morgan would do his stuff. He was a wizard, a mechanical, automatic wizard which functioned marvellously, but was without imagination. On the night of the 16th he complained of feeling tired. It was the first and last time I had ever heard him say a word about himself, and I had known him for three years. It was just three o'clock and we were running only one wire. I was nodding over the reports at my desk and not paying much attention to him when he spoke. Jim, he said, does it feel close in here to you? Why no, John, I answered. But I'll open a window if you like. Never mind, he said. I reckon I'm just a little tired. That was all that was said and I went on working. Every ten minutes or so I would walk over and take a pile of copy that had stacked up neatly beside the typewriter as the messages were printed out in triplicate. It must have been twenty minutes after he spoke that I noticed he had opened up the other wire and was using both typewriters. I thought it was a little unusual, as there was nothing very hot coming in. On my next trip I picked up the copy from both machines and took it back to my desk to sort out the duplicates. The first wire was running out the usual sort of stuff, and I looked over it hurriedly. Then I turned to the second pile of copy. I remembered it particularly because the story was from a town I had never heard of. Zebico. Here is the dispatch. I saved a duplicate of it from our files. Zebico, September 16th, CP Bulletin. The heaviest mist in the history of the city settled over the town at four o'clock yesterday afternoon. All traffic has stopped and the mist hangs like a pall over everything. Lights of ordinary intensity fail to pierce the fog, which is constantly growing heavier. Scientists here are unable to agree as to the cause, and the local weather bureau states that the like has never occurred before in the history of the city. At 7 p.m. last night, the municipal authorities... 
more. That was all there was, nothing out of the ordinary at a bureau headquarters, but, as I say, I noticed the story because of the name of the town. It must have been fifteen minutes later that I went over for another batch of copy. Morgan was slumped down in his chair and had switched his green electric light shade, so that the gleam missed his eyes, and hit only the top of the two typewriters. Only the usual stuff was in the right-hand pile, but the left-hand batch carried another story from Zebico. All press dispatches come in takes, meaning that parts of many different stories are strung along together, perhaps with but a few paragraphs of each coming through at a time. This second story was marked, Add Fog. Here is the copy. At 7 p.m. the fog had increased noticeably. All lights were now invisible, and the town was shrouded in pitch darkness. As a peculiarity of the phenomenon, the fog is accompanied by a sickly odour, comparable to nothing yet experienced here. Below that, in customary press fashion, was the hour, 327, and the initials of the operator, J.M. There was only one other story in the pile from the second wire. Here it is. Second ad, Zebico Fog. Accounts as to the origin of the mist differ greatly. Among the most unusual is that of the sexton of the local church, who groped his way to headquarters in a hysterical condition, and declared that the fog originated in the village churchyard. It was first visible as a soft grey blanket clinging to the earth above the graves, he stated. Then it began to rise, higher and higher. A subterranean breeze seemed to blow it in billows, which split up and then joined together again. Fog phantoms, writhing in anguish, twisted the mist into queer forms and figures. And then, in the very thick mist of the mass, something moved. I turned and ran from the accursed spot. Behind me I heard screams coming from the houses bordering on the graveyard. Although the sexton's story is generally discredited, a party has left to investigate. Immediately after telling his story, the sexton collapsed and is now in a local hospital, unconscious. Queer story, wasn't it? Not that we aren't used to it, for a lot of unusual stories come in over the wire. But for some reason or other, perhaps because it was so quiet that night, the report of the fog made a great impression on me. It was almost with dread that I went over to the waiting piles of copy. Morgan did not move, and the only sound in the room was the tap-tap of the sounders. It was ominous. Nerve-wracking. There was another story from Zebico in the pile of copy. I seized on it anxiously. New lead Zebico Fog CP The rescue party which went out at 11 p.m. to investigate a weird story of the origin of a fog which, since late yesterday, has shrouded the city in darkness, has failed to return. Another and larger party has been dispatched. Meanwhile the fog has, if possible, grown heavier. It seeps through the cracks in the doors and fills the atmosphere with a depressing odour of decay. It is oppressive, terrifying, bearing with it a subtle impression of things long dead. Residents of the city have left their homes and gathered in the local church, where the priests are holding services of prayer. The scene is beyond description. Grown folk and children are alike terrified, and many are almost beside themselves with fear. Amid the wisps of vapour which partly veil the church auditorium, an old priest is praying for the welfare of his flock. They alternately wail and cross themselves. From the outskirts of the city may be heard cries of unknown voices. They echo through the fog in queer, uncadenced minor keys. The sounds resemble nothing so much as wind whistling through a gigantic tunnel. But the night is calm, and there is no wind. The second rescue party more. I am a calm woman, and never in a dozen years spent with the wires have I been known to become excited. But despite myself, I rose from my chair and walked to the window. Could I be mistaken, or far down in the canyons of the city beneath me, did I see a faint trace of fog? It was all imagination. In the press room the click of the sounders seemed to have raised the tempo of their tune. Morgan alone had not stirred from his chair. 
his head sunk between his shoulders. He tapped the dispatches out on the typewriters with one finger of each hand. He looked to sleep, but no. Endlessly, efficiently, the two machines rattled off line after line, as relentlessly and effortlessly as death itself. There was something about the monotonous movement of the typewriter keys that fascinated me. I walked over and stood behind his chair, reading over his shoulder the type as it came into being, word by word. Ah, here was another. Flash Zebico CP. There will be no more bulletins from this office. The impossible has happened. No messages have come into this room for twenty minutes. We are cut off from the outside and even the streets below us. I will stay with the wire until the end. It is the end indeed. Since 4 p.m. yesterday the fog has hung over the city. Following reports from the sexton of the local church, two rescue parties were sent out to investigate conditions on the outskirts of the city. Neither party has ever returned, nor was any word received from them. It is quite certain now that they will never return. From my instrument I can gaze down on the city beneath me. From the position of this room on the thirteenth floor nearly the entire city can be seen. Now I can see only a thick blanket of blackness where customarily are lights and life. I fear greatly that the wailing cries heard constantly from the outskirts of the city are the death cries of the inhabitants. They are constantly increasing in volume and are approaching the centre of the city. The fog yet hangs over everything. If possible, it is even heavier than before, but the conditions have changed. Instead of an opaque, impenetrable wall of odorous vapour, there now swirls and writhes a shapeless mass in contortions of almost human agony. Now and again the mass parts and I catch a brief glimpse of the streets below. People are running to and fro, screaming in despair. A vast bedlam of sound flies up to my window, and above all is the immense whistling of unseen and unfelt winds. The fog has again swept over the city, and the whistling is coming closer and closer. It is now directly beneath me. God! An instant ago the mist opened, and I caught a glimpse of the streets below. The fog is not simply vapour. It lives! By the side of each moaning and weeping human is a companion figure. An aura of strange and vari-coloured hues. How the shapes cling, each to a living thing. The men and women are down, flat on their faces. The fog figures caress them lovingly. They are kneeling beside them. They are... But I dare not tell it. The prone and writhing bodies have been stripped of their clothing. They are being consumed, piecemeal. A merciful wall of hot steaming vapour has swept over the whole scene. I can see no more. Beneath me the wall of vapour is changing colours. It seems to be lighted by internal fires. No, it isn't. I have made a mistake. The colours are from above. Reflections from the sky. Look up! Look up! The whole sky is in flames! Colours as yet unseen by man or demon. The flames are moving. They have started to intermix. The colours are rearranging themselves. They are so brilliant that my eyes burn, and they are a long way off. Now they have begun to swirl, to circle in and out, twisting in intricate designs and patterns. The lights are racing each with each, a kaleidoscope of unearthly brilliance. I have made a discovery. There is nothing harmful in the lights. They radiate force and friendliness, almost cheeriness. But by their very strength, they hurt. As I look, they are swinging closer and closer, a million miles at each jump, millions of miles with the speed of light. Hi! It is light of quintessence of all light. Beneath it the fog melts into a jeweled mist, radiant, rainbow-coloured of a thousand varied spectra. I can see the streets. Why, they are filled with people. The lights are coming closer. They are all around me. I am enveloped. I... 
The message stopped abruptly. The wire to Zebico was dead. Beneath my eyes in a narrow circle of light from under the green lampshade, the black printing no longer spun itself letter by letter across the page. The room seemed filled with a solemn quiet, a silence vaguely impressive, powerful. I looked down at Morgan. His hands had dropped nervelessly at his sides, while his body had hunched over peculiarly. I turned the lamp shade back, throwing light squarely in his face. His eyes were staring, fixed. Filled with a sudden foreboding, I stepped beside him and called Chicago on the wire. After a second, the sounder clicked its answer. Why? But there was something wrong. Chicago was reporting that wire two had not been used throughout the evening. Morgan, I shouted. Morgan, wake up. It isn't true. Someone has been hoaxing us. Why? In my eagerness, I grasped him by the shoulder. His body was quite cold. Morgan had been dead for hours. Could it be that his sensitized brain and automatic fingers had continued to record impressions, even after the end? I shall never know, for I shall never again handle the night shift. Search in a world atlas discloses no town of Zebico. Whatever it was that killed John Morgan will forever remain a mystery.